Hi, good evening. Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you. And we are live. We are on already. Sharon, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. We all can hear you. Is there a change from what uh, we tried out a little while ago? Hello, can you hear me, Cherian? I can hear you. I can hear you. Are you not able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Guys, uh, somebody could you comment and tell me if uh, I'm audible and uh, is, is the picture all right? I think I can see a couple of comments happening today. We have uh, see uh, we are very specifically uh, addressing Indian breeds today. Ah, uh, yes, here. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me, Cherian? Yes, perfect. I'm sorry. There's a massive storm outside, and there was a power outage, and we were in a oh. bit of a spot for five minutes. Okay, 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 okay. Are you good now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. I, I, I lost power like 10 minutes before we started the session. I was thinking, okay, at least the power should be back by then. <laughs> so, no, I, just, I just lost a beautiful bonsai because it flew off my balcony. What are you saying? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there was a little pot sitting right next to my balcony and there was a massive storm and it flew off. So, oh, uh, it flew off completely? You didn't even find it below yeah, your it house. fell off. No, no, okay. we did. But like I mean, it was a, half the branches are gone and the pot's broken, and so it's okay. Anyway, all right. So shall we get started? So, I think. Uh? Please, yes. So yes. I, I, I think we can start. Uh, you know, broadly uh, discussing the various kinds of dogs that we have around. You know, we have the regular mm -hmm. the in yeah. dog that we see everywhere on the street, which varies slightly from north all the way down to south. And then we have mm -hmm. the breed that we see as partly, partially recognized uh, within the Kennel Club of India, which are seen at the dog shows. And then there are many who don't come to the dog shows, but, you know, kind of broadly recognized in India. So shall we just go through that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Good. Your signal is breaking yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Okay. Let's go and he's disappeared. <laughs> Am I okay. Am I still on? Can uh, are you, you I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, now I can see you. Okay. So I was saying we will, uh, you know. Yes, you were saying something. Go with the different kind of uh, Indian breeds that we have. We have the hounds, the sight hounds, a lot of them, which a lot of people are very familiar with, most of which, which comes from the south. Then we have the sheep dogs and, uh, you know, the mountain dogs, the Himalayan sheep dog and the Gaddi dog and all of those. Uh, we have the famous Indian spits. Right. So you can take any of them and start. With yes. Them. No, it's a group classification. You, as far as the sheep dogs are concerned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are the Bakharwal, there's the Bakharwal and then there's the... Western Uttarakhand Mastiff, and then there's the Tibetan Mastiff and the Himalayan Sheepdog, and all of them can be put in one group for uh, the sake of discussion. Right. But basically, uh, but basically, as the name suggests, uh, these are high altitude uh, dogs domesticated uh, by people who are generally, you know, uh, mobile. Right. So the shepherds in the shepherds in the mountains are not static. Okay they move with the season okay 
so they'll they'll come to the foothills and then they'll go back into high up high into the mountains depending on the season mm -hmm. so the dogs that they keep are the himalayan sheep dog for example or the gaddi kutta mm -hmm. are dogs that have that are living with these uh, uh, families okay and moving with them and okay. moving with them and uh, they are all of similar size these three or four dogs whether it's the uttarakhand mastiff or the bakarwal the bakarwal okay. is uh, the bakarwal is from the pir panjal uh, range okay At, again high altitude okay so uh, the similarities between the tibetan mastiff and the uh, himalayan sheep dog uh, and these are generic similarities right you know the type of coat okay the tail carriage okay the size okay and all these dogs that you will classify as uh, shepherds mm -hmm. uh they are they are they are very um, uh dependable they are very uh, loyal but okay. they are fierce but they are fiercely loyal okay yes and they are not uh dogs that would like to be uh, you know uh playing around with children or living inside your or staying inside your living room and uh, they are they are basically aloof by nature mm -hmm. they like their space they are aloof okay. by nature they'll be awake throughout the night okay it comes as a basic instinct okay so um it's it's a group of uh, you know uh, dogs i don't know whether you want me to talk about the description because uh, you know if you can flash a picture you will see that most of yeah. them have very similar features now that's the bakarwal right. yes there is a bakarwal now, see, uh, we have a himalayan see. sheep dog yeah now the yeah. bakarwal the himalayan sheep dog and the and the and the gaddi kutta if we take these three pictures for example right you will find you will find them of similar anatomy right you see the tail carriage yeah you see the massiveness of chest right you see the lung room that they have because of right. the altitude because of the right. kind of terrain that they have to cover right you see that they are not very acutely or uh, you know they don't have uh, acute angles in the rear right because there's a particular purpose for which they have been bred right you will find you will find that most of them will have a mane to keep them warm around the neck right they are naturally drop ears okay you will not find pricked ears in the mountain shepherd dogs whether okay. it's the bakarwal or the himalayan sheep dog or the gaddi okay. kutta okay is it to do with the temperature or yes you see even when you look at the snow dogs that are registered and recognized as breeds right uh whether you talk of the uh, uh, mountain pyrenean or the saint bernard okay they are not naturally pricked right uh the only exception to this uh, is the akita and the alaskan malamute which can be or the siberian husky which can be in cold climates but still are prick but then they don't belong to this family of dogs they okay. belong to a totally different family of dogs their ancestry right. is different okay so uh, uh and these have a thick double coat weather proof right so, so for the it, it, it's, it's an interesting yeah. all right no please please go ahead yeah no 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 i was just saying for the interest of everyone who's just joining in uh, now Uh, I just want to just uh, update them that we're discussing Indian breeds, and we've just started with the uh, you know Himalayan sheep dog and the variety of dogs because uh, broadly our Indian breeds are divided in. Uh, I mean, we can see different kind of dogs, so we're just trying to group this discussion into breeds of similar type. Um, so we've just started with Himalayan sheep dog and the Gaddi Kutta and the Bakarwal dog. Uh, over to you, sir. back to the discussion yeah so uh, as i was saying as i was saying that you know uh, you will find certain similar features in these uh, shepherds which are uh, mountain based right now the himalayan sheep dog uh, we have uh, 
I'm sorry I'm saying this, but it's a breed that we have sort of, you know, claimed to be Indian. Okay. And it's cousin mm -hmm. of much larger size with a different head plane, okay. different skull. Okay. But very similar in type. It's similar in coat, similar in tail. Right. Is the is the Tibetan Mastiff. Tibetan Mastiff. Now, it, it's a Tibetan now, Mastiff Tibetan recognized Mastiff. by the FCI? Oh, yes, of course it is recognized by the FCI. Right. So, okay. But uh, let's not go into what has recently been done by the Chinese to the Tibetan Mastiff because that's right. not what the original Tibetan Mastiff is. Okay. But uh, there are some, uh, you know, established kennels all over the world in the U.S., in England, in uh, in uh, Sweden. Okay. And here in India, we have a few distinguished breeders of the Tibetan Mastiff. Mm -hmm. Why I bring that breed in is that though it's not Indian because it derives its name from Tibet, but it's a very similar in feature. Right. What is it recognized uh, as the country of origin for uh, Tibetan Mastiff? Mm, Tibet. Now, okay. let's say China then. Okay. All right. It's basically, it's because Tibet is no country, so... Right, right, right. Yeah, but uh, uh, it's a second cousin, or it's a, it's a cousin, why a second cousin? It's a cousin right. to the Himalayan sheepdog. So, now... Okay. When, we were, when we were growing up, the Gaddi was uh, a loose term. Okay. So if you if you go up into the mountains during the winters mm -hmm. in the high altitude and live with the villagers, right? Then you'll find packs of dogs which are either Gaddi dogs or Himalayan sheep dogs, mm -hmm. and the original people will not distinguish between them. Okay. And there's a there's a tan, there's a liver, there's a black and tan. All these colors are natural to the HSD as well as to the uh, Gaddi Kutta. Right. So, uh, I mean, when we discuss the typical breeds that we see around, which has come from outside of this country, uh, you know, uh, maybe in India we don't recognize for that matter the importance of conservation and breeders of that particular breed. But when it comes to our own mm -hmm. breeds, which are uh, in a way not yet formally recognized with uh, an appropriate breed standard, uh, some sort of a uniformity or predictability in behavior and, uh, you know, uh, the physical appearance. Uh, what, uh, what would you look at and say is the role of conservation and importance of breeders and the breed clubs of these dogs? I mean, this I think would apply, uh, you know, the same way to every Indian breed that we have now. And some of the breeds have been taken up very seriously by some of the breeders and the clubs. But there are so many of them. So how? what is the role of breeders and conservationists, especially so? And then it would be, I think, easier for people to relate it to other breeds as well. Why should you have good breeders? That's a, that's a very nice question. I'll tell you, uh, yesterday I was on the show and I said that, you know, we need to respect breeders and right. uh, it's good that we are taking this topic up again. So what are breeders? Breeders are those people who have the, the passion to uh, understand gene pools. Right. They have the passion to understand what, what two specimens, if brought together, would contribute and what they would produce. Right. Now, unless we have breeders, nobody at random is going to make the effort of understanding genetics, of understanding bloodlines, and of making the effort to actually put a particular female to a particular male book. If you have to zero in on certain breed traits, particularly in breeds that are still to be recognized by the bodies. Right. Then you must have a group of people, and you can call them breeders, right. who are willing to put in the money and the effort and the time consistent breed from that gene pool. Right. And, and conserve those traits. Right. Now, uh, you know... You can have uh, individual X who has a beautiful uh, Himalayan sheepdog bitch. 
and his next door neighbor has a beautiful and a beautiful Tibetan mastiff. Right. Now they are both they they are both women and they have no idea of ethics behind it, and they find them similar looking and similar they looking. Breed. Yeah. And I think in general, when it comes so to they these breed. Breed, they say, battle, okay, right? oh, yours is. Yeah. So that's where you need the breeders and the conservationists to understand mm -hmm. that they are actually two different breeds and we need to preserve special characteristics, the special traits mm. of a particular breed. Okay. So I mind uh, for breed conservation, for uh, developing a gene pool, for bringing, you know, when you go for a breed registration to the FCI, for example. Right. I'll give you a small example. Kennel Club India is presently working very hard okay. to get the Rajapalayam recognized by the FCI. Right. Now, one of the requirements of the Raja, for the Rajapalayam to be recognized by the FCI is DNA thing of five generations. Right. Now, how do you expect testing of five generations without educated breeders? Without those who are following up, you know, keeping uh, puppies born in their homes from certain parents, and then breeding again and doing another generation DNA. Right. So, uh, I mean, any breeder, if I have to breed a boxer or you have to breed a caucus man, we sit at the gene. Right. It's absolutely pivotal. So my question is now, uh, recognition by an international body is one which is extremely important. But for us to get there, uh, do we already have, for example, a breed standard specified for breeds such as, like, let's say, for example, a Himalayan uh, Sheepdog or a Gaddi Kutta, for example. Do we have any lo local uh, clubs w for these breeds, this particular, these two breeds specifically? No, unfortunately, you might. There might be an unprofessional amateur body somewhere up in the hills in Uttarakhand, mm -hmm. but there is no recognized breed club for either the Gadikuta or the Himalayan Sheepdog. Okay. In fact, the Gadikuta is not even recognized as a breed by the Kennel Club of India. Leave aside the mm -hmm. FCI. Okay. The only mountain shepherd that is recognized by the Kennel Club of India is the Himalayan Sheepdog. I mean, Indian. Okay. So, so for the, the Himalayan sheepdog, Bakarwa, we have some sort Bakarwa, of standard. The Gaddi Kutta not recognized. Okay. Yes. For the Himalayan sheepdog, we have some sort of standard. It's not an elaborate standard. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, the, it's, a booklet was made about 15 years ago by the Kennel Club of India. Laying down the basic standards of these breeds. Okay. Now, over the last 15 years, a lot has happened in development of these breeds. Okay. And uh, as I speak, the Kennel Club of India, I think, is in the process of finalizing a new handbook. Okay. Which will have detailed breed standards of all these Indian breeds. Right. Because I it's think it basically is basically also... a, a blueprint that is like a guide. Okay. Because my point of view was, apart from developing the breed standard, maybe the Kennel Club of India should themselves, uh, you know, take the initiative in, uh, you know, putting some breeders together and, uh, you know, getting some work done towards, you know, you uh, bringing in uniform gene pool or uh, recorded gene pool, for example. You know, I, I think this also requires some amount they of fun. Okay. They are. Okay. It's a club of native Indian breeds, which is, uh, you know, working very hard. Uh, Dr. S Ravi, Santhil Ravi of uh, Coimbatore, who's yeah. uh, uh, pioneering this Indian breed standard. Indian breeds, yeah. And uh, Ravi Setamadai, right? Dr. Ravi Setamadai. Hello? I think we've lost him for a second. 
thanks to the power outage or the storms in Delhi. Stay online. I think. Uh, okay, Rahul, we shall uh, pick up your question. Um, yes, we shall pick up your question on uh, breeders' cruelty practices and the horror stories and stuff like that. Yes, extremely important to have the law around it. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Sharat would have a view on it. Yeah, Anjali is commenting that there is a huge storm happening there. I hope he joins back soon. Mm. In the meantime, uh, what I'll do is I'll just quickly also take you through the rest of the breeds that we want to cover. Uh, Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you, but I can't see you. I don't know. I think I'll have to log in again because some sort of an internet problem, I presume. Okay, let me just uh, remove you from the stream and let log, me in, try again. And log in again. Yeah. Okay, so while uh, he is coming back, I think I would just take you through uh, some of the breeds that we would like to discuss today. And I think no discussion on Indian breeds can be uh, done without covering our own favorite Indian spits, right? AKA the popularly known uh, Pomeranian. So I think I had a question from, uh, uh, I think, uh, who was it who asked me that question? Was it Karan or somebody had asked me this question a little while ago. I had seen uh, the post. Uh, just one second. I'm just scrolling through the comments to see who had commented on this. Uh, I think it was Musarat who had asked me about uh, the confusion between the Indian Spitz and uh, the Pomeranian. I think we'll wait for him to come back to answer this question. So we have the Indian Spitz. And of course, then we have the lesser known Kumon Mastiff, the Bully Kuta, which is gaining popularity right now. Uh, I'm just waiting for Sharat to come in. Yes, you're back. Hello, are we back? Uh, yes, you're back. And I was just uh, running everyone through the breeds that we have uh, in our slides today. And I was saying no discussion okay. on Indian breeds would be over without discussing this breed. <laughs> it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating breed. You know what has <laughs> happened? Yeah. Uh, and I have a personal experience of this because this is the first dog that we got way back in 1972. Right. And, and at that time, there was nothing called the Indian Spitz. Right. It was a Pomeranian, is it? No, 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 no. If you look at the Spitz, right. it's as it uh, in its origin shape mm -hmm. it's a generic name it's it's a type of dog right and in Germany you get them in three sizes okay now when we got spits in India there was a wide variation in the size mm -hmm. if you look at the standard of the greater German spits mm -hmm. it is a substantial dog Okay. It's a pretty large dog. Okay. So what was happening in India is what was happening in India is that the greater German spits and the lesser German spits were all being put together. Okay. So you were getting a large variation in size. Mm -hmm. And we had all also those getting... sizes in India. Did we have all those sizes in India? Yeah, we had a few greater German spits and we had a few lesser German spits and we had a few that were a little, uh, were completely white and we had a few that were black and we had a few that were a little, you know, on the fawn side, which is uh, a bit of a coloration or a tinge. Okay. And I think we so had blacks. Indian spits, Indian spits 
Ants is a breed that is actually registered and recognized only by the Kennel Club of India. Okay. So if you look for registration of the Indian Spitz in the FCI, you will not find it. Okay. What we have been able to achieve is a sort of a standard uh, standardization or consistency in size. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, the basic features are exactly the same as those of a Greater German Spitz or the original Spitz as recognized by the FCI. Okay. If you look so, at the FCI standard, you will find that the Pomeranian is also a Spitz. Uh, right. So, is it so, because uh, Spitz being a larger it's, variety it's, uh, that these guys got started being called uh, the Pomeranian? Is that the story behind it? No, 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 no. The Pomeranian, okay. uh, the, as I said, the Spitz is a generic name. Right, right, right. It, it describes the features, it describes the set of eyes, it describes the shape of ears, it describes the shape of the jaw, the length of the muzzle, the structure of the uh, dentition. Mm -hmm. it, describes the, it describes the tail carriage, it describes the type of coat. And it this is basically a generic term used for dogs below, uh, performing a certain function. Right. The Pomeranian has been derived from it to, you know, uh, contain the size. Okay. While while re while retaining these distinct features of the shape of the head, the shape of the eyes, the shape of the ears, etc., etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, over the years, of course, over the years, each of these breeds have developed distinct features okay. now. So, the shape of the head of, on a palm is now different from the shape of the head on the spitz. Okay. But the generic family remains the spits. Okay. So, shall we move on from... Uh, but, uh, I mean, I think it is also a very low-maintenance dog, even with the coat that it has. I think grooming needs are uh, somehow a lot easier than some of the other breeds that come in, right? The coat, the texture of the hair is, I think, quite different, isn't it? Uh, of all the uh, spits breeds, whether it's the Semoid, the Greater German Spitz, the Klein the Indian Spitz for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, the Pomeranian is supposed to have, the Pomer Pomeranian is supposed to have a coat that is rough to touch. Right. It's not supposed to be silky. Silky, It's not supposed yeah. to be wooly. Mm -hmm. And the texture on a Spitz coat is different from the texture on a Samoyed coat or on a Pomeranian coat. Mm -hmm. But they are much easier to groom spits than a pioneer. Yes, I would think so because uh, even without too much of grooming that happens around the countryside, we see them, you know, in fairly good conditions compared to, you know, any of the other breeds that's come into the country without, you know, regular work or maintenance on them. Because, yeah, because if you walk and then you brush along the layer of hair, along the right. layer of coat, you get, you get. But in the Pomeranian, you are not supposed to be brushing off. Yeah, you go on the opposite, right? Against the layer of hair. You go the opposite because yeah. because you want to bring the rough texture out and you want right. to make it look like a round ball. So, right. yes, it's much easier to groom a spitz. Okay. All right. So, that's an Indian dog which requires, I think, from the Himalayan mountain dogs, which can be made to look really wonderful to an Indian Spitz, which requires some amount of grooming. And, you know, I always look at dogs, where is it uh, there is a potential to groom this dog and make them look nice. So anyway, I think now we can move on from these breeds to uh, one of the new breeds that we see around, which is the Bully Kutta, which uh, has been gaining popularity. Oh, the Bully Kutta. Yeah. So the breed has been gaining popularity. Um, I'm sorry. One second. I'm trying to figure. Yeah. It's been trying uh, gaining popularity across a lot of people, people who kept Rottweilers and people who like the big dogs, the aggressive dogs. They've been wanting to get Bully Kutas. Can we hear more about the origin of Bully Kutas and how it's been evolving? Uh, uh, forgive me for saying this, but uh, 
uh, amongst the many things that we are not grateful to Pakistan for, this is another one. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, you know, it's a breed that has been bred, created by mixing different types of dogs. Okay. And so, and so different, not only in size, but in the entire anatomy, in the entire structure of their head, in the entire purpose for which they have been bred. What they have mm -hmm. done is they have crossed, they have crossed breeds like the Staffordshire Terrier, the Bull Terrier, the Amstaff, mm -hmm. the Great Dane, the English Mastiff, God knows what all. Okay. And the purpose has been solely to create a large animal mm -hmm. which is subject to which is subject to this very cruel game dog fights mm -hmm. and uh, people who are now becoming uh, you know fond of this breed are becoming fond of it only for uh, its image as a masculine dog as uh, right as something that would, you know, give you a macho age, I don't know what. Right. But, but the breeders themselves, unfortunately, the breeders themselves have not been able to achieve any consistency. Mm -hmm. There's no consistency in temperament. Okay. There's no consistency in size. Right. If you Google it, if you Google the bully kutta, even Wikipedia will tell you that, you know, it's not safe for the owner as well as the other dogs. Okay. Is there a breed standard yet for the no. bully kutta or is there an Indian bully kutta? No, 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 no. There or is no it... breed standard for the bully kutta. Or is it still going in the direction of bigger body, bigger and... head? Let's get as big as we can get. Yeah, it's a fighter. They are they are breeding a fighter. It's like breeding the you know. There's this uh, uh, breed of uh, fighting cocks called the Asil. Asil, yeah. This is and, the Asil uh, of the dog world, is it? Yeah. So it's it's the Asil of the dogs. You're breeding a dog basically to fight. Okay. And. Uh, I don't foresee, very honestly, I don't foresee the breeders of the Bully Kutta achieving any consistency in the near future. <laughs> okay. So Simply let's... because they are not they are not concentrating. Okay, and I think also the heart is not at the right place in a way because uh, the objective is, I think, pretty much uh, build the group job breed the largest possible dog with the highest amount of aggression and then go in for a fight. Isn't that so? Uh, we are losing Sharat again. To okay, you're back. No, I, I don't have audio from you, Sharat. Your mic is not working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now I can hear you. Off, I know. Hello. Yeah, yeah. So now, now, can we repeat that again, please? Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you too. Although it's freezing a little bit, but okay, I can great. see you. I know you're there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's something drastically wrong with the internet here today because of the it's storm. Like it, yeah. I'm so sorry for the to the viewers, but it's beyond control. Right. So uh, back to the bully kuta. So is it still where you know try and pack in as much size and aggression into the dog, and that's what the bully kuta is right now? Is that why you think they're not able to achieve any kind of uh, uniformity or standard to follow? Yes, that's one reason. And the other reason is that, you know, uh, the anatomy, the structure of the dog is not the only thing of the dog. Okay. If a dog is to be bred for a purpose, it has to have 
it, it, it has to have a temperament that contributes to fulfilling that purpose. Right. Here you have a dog that's only purpose is to fight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I mean that, you know, how do you create a standard for an animal that you are breeding only to fight? What's the mm -hmm. purpose? Right. What's the objective? You know, when we, when we judge a standard, we do form and function. Right. So, do you want the judges to judge the bully kutta on how good a fighter it is? Okay. And so, we also I mean, have... That's not going to happen. Right. And we also have these breeds like Kumon Mastiff, which is lesser known, I would say. Have you come across many of them? And, uh, you know, uh, what is your... Uh, what have you seen of them? The Kumon Mastiff. No, the Kumon... I have. I have come across the Kumon Mastiff and... Uh, you know, if you drive up into the hills uh, in the Kumao region, you still find them uh, locally amongst the villagers. Right. And uh, now uh, look at this dog, uh, uh, Cherian, and put on a little coat on him. Put on the same color coat as his natural color is. Let it be mm. red. Right. Or tan or rust or whatever you want to call the color. Okay. And you will find that other than the, other than the brindling, which mm -hmm. you find on this short coat, right? It's again very similar to a HSD or a Gadi uh, Kutta. Okay. Even amongst even amongst the long coated varieties like the Saint Bernard, you have the smooth coated Saint Bernard. Right. So the Kumau Mastiff in terms of size, in terms of temperament, in terms of basic character and traits, is nothing but a shepherd. Okay. Okay, so it's the same one with and, uh, uh, <coughs> a coat and maybe a little more bulk? Uh, it appears to be uh, carrying a little more bulk because it's uh, without its hair. Okay. But... Uh, if you if you look at uh, the size, um, you know probably closer to a Tibetan Mastiff in size than an HSD. Mm -hmm. But then within the HSD, when I say HSD, I mean Himalayan Sheepdog. Himalayan Even Sheepdog. within the HSD, you don't still have consistency of size. Okay. You still don't have consistency of size. So you'll get something which is 23 inches or 24 inches at the withers and then suddenly you'll get something which is 27 inches at the withers. Right. So uh, apart from the fact that it has got shorter coat than its two cousins, it's basically right. of the same uh, family. Right. I think it was important for us to go through these breeds because, you know, every discussion on Indian native breeds, the first picture that comes to everyone's mind is probably a Mudal Hound or a Rajapalayan. So I thought, you know, it would be uh, nice for us to kind of start this uh, discussion with our northern, uh, you know, uh, dogs that we see in the mountains and then come back to the plains and see what those sight hounds are all about. So uh, I think it would be a good time for us to move to the sight hounds and, uh, you know, uh, look at yes, some... Yes, absolutely. It's, um... You know, a lot of people are familiar with seeing this when you hear Indian breeds, uh, you know, uh, rather than the dogs that we discuss right now. So uh, we have the Caravan Hound and the Pashmi and we have the Modal Hound and uh, the Kanni and uh, the Chippi Parai. Although a lot of them look very similar in appearance, can we go into details of what really distinguishes some of these breeds, especially uh, Mudal Hound and Caravan Hound? You don't see uh, too much of, uh, you know, differences recorded in many places or clearly written in many places. I'll, so, I'll come to this uh, question which you've raised, but before that, mm -hmm. before we move from the mountains down into the plains of the Deccan or the right. South. Yeah. Amongst the sight hounds. Okay. There is an Indian breed called the Rampur hound. Yes. Do you have yeah, a picture I, of the Rampur hound, uh, Cherry? I do have a picture. It's not the best picture that I could find, but now, yeah. Yes, yes. Now, Rampur is a small, uh, a sort of a small, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, it used to have a nawab right and it's a small district right at the beginning of the mountains when you are going up from bareilly towards pantnagar and into the hills you have this uh, little small uh, princely town called rampur okay and uh, when we started showing dogs uh, rampur hounds were still around okay as a matter of fact there were a lot of rampur hounds there were a lot of rampur hounds in the 80s and in the early 90s mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then they sort of disappeared for 20 years okay and the resurgence of the indian breeds has now come from the south when we talk of the caravan and the mudhol absolutely but yeah. in the 70s and 80s the 70s and 80s the only sight hound that was known to indian uh, shows right was the rampur hound was the rampur hound okay and rampur hounds were consistently exhibited and shown yeah. and judged so it's not that the indian breeds uh, sight hounds are something new they have been around for many many years i'm sure what i really like about the rampur hound is also the quality of color they carry very significantly distinct between one part of the color and you know if you have the brown and brindle in one part and the white the distinction is perfectly marked out in rampur hounds and you know it just Yes it's it's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a it's a beautifully made breed right and uh, there's a very small gene pool now left of the rampur hound right but the color that you have mentioned is a distinct feature right 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 as a matter of fact it's one of the features when you are judging between the rampur hound and the other hounds that we'll talk about now subsequently okay so uh, it's a it's a breed but your pointed question on the difference between the caravan and the doll right okay let's uh, start from the head of the dog of the Now we okay. must understand that the caravan the caravan and the doll do not hunt the same game okay the mudhol hunts larger game than the caravan okay and what would constitute larger game so we are talking basically of all sorts of vermin of hare and even a small fox okay now the um, caravan has a narrow head narrow mm -hmm. skull okay whereas whereas the mudhol has a larger head a longer muzzle and a broader skull right and the a shape that you meant, uh, primarily we, we, because primarily because of the difference in the size of the game that they hunt mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the first distinction you must draw between these two breeds is on the type of the head and the size of the head right the mudhol will have a broader skull and longer muzzle and larger head than the caravan mm -hmm. and the where are they from the difference and that yeah. lies within sorry go sorry, on go, go on. ahead yeah, yeah no 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 go on go on go on no the second difference lies within the head and that's you know in the shape of the eyes and the stop now okay. the stop is the area between we go from the top of the head that's the occiput down to the bridge of the eye and then right. from there to the tip of the nose right that small spot between these two areas is called the stop so essentially the bridge of the eye isn't it yes essentially that lower right. it's it's at the end of the eye not at the top of the eye but at the end at the, the bottom eye. yeah okay where the eye ends right so and and you'll find a difference in the uh, carrying forward you'll find a difference in the size now the mudhol okay. is the largest of the indian hounds okay when the standards are being formulated now the average mudhol the standard will say should be 27 to 28 inches tall at the withers that's a large dog <clears throat> okay 
some of the uh, people who have gone to do the breed survey in uh, districts of karnataka mm -hmm. have found have found specimens that are 33 inches at the withers mm -hmm. now to draw a parallel 33 inches at the withers is the size of a great dane All right Right. Which is a very large dog. Absolutely. So now, between the caravan and the mood hole, the yeah. size difference. No, no, sorry. Uh, go on, go on, go on. So, so the, the the size, the, the size is the most distinct difference between the caravan and the mood hole. The okay. mood hole being the largest of the Indian hounds. Okay. Now, uh, typically, when you see most of these Indian hounds at the dog show, especially the caravans and the mood hole, they are absolutely skinny. Right? Yes. And uh, mo mo I mean, a lot of times maybe they lack muscle and all of that. But what? how skinny is all right to be skinny? And, uh, you know, what is acceptable? Is that how they should be? Or should you they know, have... I'll, yeah, that's a very nice question. It's a very nice question. When, now you look at the across the world. Mm -hmm. To... Put, put the weight of the Indian sighthound in correct perspective. You look at the sighthounds across the world. Right. Uh, you look at a you look at an Azovac. Pull out a picture of the Azovac chariot. Right. I am putting it up right now. Now that yeah. is an Azovac. That Azovac is an African breed. Mm -hmm. It's from uh, areas like Burkina Faso and uh, Niger and uh, Mali and all those countries. Right. Now, look at the weight on this dog. Right. This is the ideal weight for a sighthound. Okay. You zoom in and you'll see that the last three ribs, the last three vertebrae. Right. Are visible. Right. You zoom in and see that the pelvic bone is actually visible. Right. So how much is correct and how much is too thin is like uh, the distinction between a slim person and an emaciated person. Mm -hmm. Okay. The sight hound, the sight hound by no stretch of imagination can have even a pound of extra flesh on or fat on him. Okay. So Let's having take the slogi. There's a breed called the slogi. Yeah. Uh, where is it from? It's from the deserts. Right. You put on extra fat. Number one, it will not be able to get the desired speed to move through the desert area. Right. Number two, the surface area will be so high it will die of heat stroke. Mm -hmm. So right. the side hounds structure is again form and function what is the purpose speed <laughs> what do you do when you buy a car for racing right you drop the weight you cut off the flap yeah you drop yeah now racing racing cars don't have side view mirrors right <laughs> but they do i think but Why? yeah because you want aero <laughs> you want aerodynamism right 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 so the body is lit. There's this beautiful English word, L-I-T-H-E, mm -hmm. which is apt description on how much of weight a sighthound should carry. Right. And bear in mind that sighthounds are finicky eaters. Okay. You know, there's this story of... Uh, a deer hound once winning the, at the Westminster. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was taken for a treat to the nearest posh restaurant in Manhattan. Okay. And served the most, uh, you know, highly rated uh, fillet. <laughs> okay, I can't wait for it to get to where you can <laughs> And it just smelled it smelled the fish and left it. Didn't touch the damn thing. <laughs> so, okay. so sight hounds are
finicky eaters. They don't okay. put on body weight. All right. Get a dog. Get a dog that is healthy. Okay. But no fat. Okay. And the three vertebrae must be visible. Not right. all. Right. But it's good if three vertebrae are visible. It's, okay. It's, I think there's no that's... harm if the pelvic bone is visible. Right. So yes, they are. Uh, they'll appear undernourished, but they're not. Okay, which means that okay, it's just that they need to be toned, and at least uh, we need to focus on just the three last vertebrae, uh, not the vertebrae, rib bones or vertebrae. Ribs yeah, the, or vertebrae? The, the ribs, ribs, right? The, the rib last three ribs. Last three ribs, yeah. No harm if they are visible. Right. I think that is where we miss out uh, most times. Uh, in our case, uh, in a lot of cases, all the ribs are visible. So maybe we can fill in, fill them just enough so that just the three are visible at the end. Yeah, last three. And 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 when I say vertebrae, I mean there should be no fat on the top, no fat right. on the top line. Right. You should be able to see the bone structure of the animal. Right. Okay. It's so not a Labrador which can have half an inch of fat. Right. So if we move on to other breeds like, for example, Kanni, and, uh, you know, uh, we have Chippy Parai. It is very interesting, you know. The Kanni is something which is relatively new. Okay. Now the Kanni is, the Kanni is nothing but an offshoot of the Chippy Parai. Okay. The people from the south, particularly from Tamil Nadu, would understand, and mm -hmm. perhaps you would also know this word. Kanni is nothing but a word. Right. It describes a color. Okay. So those which are black and tan. Okay. Are the Kannis. Oh. And those which are liver or plain tan are the chippy parais. Okay, so in the picture that is here on the screen right now, the black and tan is the kanni and this the black plain and tan. Yes, the kanni has to be black and tan. Okay. And the distinct feature is, and the distinct feature is that the tan is not really the color of is not liver or is not really rich tan. <laughs> it's a very faded pale cream, sometimes even touching white. Okay, so I think this uh, dog in the image on the right is pretty much a representation of a good, uh, you know, what a kanni should be. Absolutely. And you will see that the tan is actually very light cream or white. There's no tanning okay. as such. Compare it to a German so, Shepherd's tan or a Rottweiler or a Doberman okay. tan, it's totally right. different. Okay. And so that means Kanni just comes in this one color. That's about it. Yes. And the distinct thing is that it is only in this black and tan. Okay. I, I, this you is get a Kanni which is up in any other. Yeah. You get a Kanni which is in any other color, then it's not a Kanni. Okay. So it becomes a Chippy Parai for, uh, for that matter. So, uh, easy to distinguish the Kanni. So, uh, so, so, which means anatomically and in terms of size and shape and everything, the Kanni and the Chippy Parai would exactly be the same except for the color. Yes, 99% of the Kanni and Chippy Parai are absolutely the same. The only difference is now in the black and tans, I, I was fortunate to judge them about 10 months ago in uh, down south. Uh, 200 kilometers of Coimbatore. Right. And there were 45 Kannis. Wow. Okay. Uh, yes, there were 45 Kannis, but unfortunately, the size varied from 20 to 21 inches right up to 27 inches. Okay. So we still have to achieve consistency of size in the Kanni. Mm -hmm. But uh, basic features, the structure, the anatomy, the temperament, is very similar to a chippy parai. Okay. Interesting. So, and then I, you know, I had uh, 
grouped all these dogs and i think the next uh, kind of dog while we have the rajapalem which has similarities uh, to the sight hounds there's a little more filled in they're a little more you know nice to look at uh, more pleasing to the eye um, i think temperament wise also they are pretty nice isn't it uh you know the rajapalem is an interesting breed uh, mm -hmm. of the sight hounds personally i would not group the rajapalyam as a sight hound right it was not it was not bred for the purposes of a hound okay it's basically it's basically a shepherd's guard dog mm -hmm. and uh, you will notice that the shape of the head on the rajapalyam is totally different from all the other indian sight hounds whether it's Absolutely. the chippy parai or yeah. the or, or or the caravan or the mudo or the kanni right or the rampur so this uh, is the breed that is going to get recognition under fci the first amongst okay. indian breeds right and it and it will eventually go the sight hound group that is group 10 in fci but it's not purely sight hound it's right. got a lot of guarding is uh, instinct okay and it's perhaps the only breed to my knowledge in the world which is entirely white with pink pigmentation okay there is lack of pigmentation or you want to call it pink or whatever is the correct word yeah but what is the, the right but yeah. the but the nose the nostrils the lips eyebrow the uh, sorry the eye rim are all pink but they do have their eyes being dark colored right yes the eyes can be dark colored but the rim is pink okay the pad on the feet pink okay the nostrils pink right and absolutely white without any trace of uh, any shading or spotting visible from under the coat right i think one uh, man who really it's a, put it's in a, a lovely lot breed. In, yeah i think one man who's really put in a lot into this breed has been dr ravi uh, from polachi right uh, he's been at it for a while and i remember absolutely meeting, i've been i remember meeting him in bangalore with i think over uh, close to maybe 150 uh, rajapalams he had come to uh, for the fci inspection i i i think yeah yes yes i judged i had over 70 rajapalams absolutely fast grouping yeah and uh, <coughs> let's hope that that's the first indian breed that gets fci recognition yeah that'll be a, a, a something a really nice thing for us to have achieved over here and uh, do we have a lot of these dogs going out of the country uh, uh, to other countries breeders etc is it something that people yes, fancy yes yes Yes, okay. I have. I have known of people in the U.S. and in some countries in Europe that have already imported caravans and mudols, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. have already imported uh, uh, rajapalyams. Okay. Let's see. For we have to wait for them to get recognized. Okay. And uh, also amongst all the other breeds that we have discussed, I think we've. discuss the sheep dogs in the mountains we have discussed the mastiff look alikes of our indian bully kutta and the kumon mastiff we've come down to the indian spits uh, we came uh, i think most of the scent hounds and another interesting breed that we have is the kumbai oh, this is a beautiful dog uh, the kumbai is again uh, to my in my personal opinion not really a sight sight hound it is not structured mm -hmm. to be a sight hound it's got it got it's got uh, great width it's right. got a good brisket right it's got totally different shape of rib cage from the typical sight hounds it's yes. not flat chested its head is very broad at the skull right and it's got a dark black mask the closest uh, okay. breed internationally okay internationally the closest breed to the kombai i don't know if you can pull out a picture just now of a the closest black. breed to the kombai is the thai ridgeback thai ridgeback oh yeah okay yeah that's true you i pull out a picture of the thai ridgeback now this yeah. picture which we have on the screen of the kombai just now 
Uh-huh. Is a bit of a uh, you know uh, there's a bit of a fawn touch to him but the combis that I have seen in the rings are actually red. Okay. Uh, so it, but in terms of thigh red uh, the color is not exactly the red color that the combis are, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That that color is different but the okay. structure of the dog, the carriage of the tail, the black mask this okay. is the closest that we have this is the closest that we have internationally to the thigh ridge back and okay. it's a strong dog okay very fiercely loyal mm -hmm. and and uh, it's got the heart of a lion it's going to stand its ground it's uh, medium size much smaller than all the sight hounds that we have been talking about all right the combi would. What, what, what was the origin uh, of this breed, and what have people been using them for? Basically, as I said, the Raja Pallyam and the combi are distinctly guard dogs. Okay. They are used as shepherds uh, by shepherds as guard dogs. Okay. So, uh, the nature and the uh, traits and characteristics of the combi are that of a guard dog. Okay. I think I have. So they're used for that purpose. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm just trying to pull up a picture of uh, the thigh ridgebacks just so that we can have a point of reference as well here. I think this is the breed. I, I'm not able to get a very clear picture. But yeah, you, we can pretty much see that. Uh, yeah, see the dog in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. This, this 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 picture of the combi is not uh, really the best picture that we have. We have uh, combis which have, yeah, and, and we have combis. Too, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the problem is that we are uh, still not consistent with the shape of the ear. The thigh right. ridge back is pricked, but the combi, but the combi isn't. The thigh ridge back okay. has erect ears. Right. So uh, and I think uh, we've come towards the end of it and I think uh, I was also trying to go visually how the dogs looked and uh, you know uh, I was then coming down to our dog that we see all over the dog the Indian pariah dog yes so even this that's uh, a generic it, term oh, all right so the, 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 the uh, paria is a generic term it's okay. basically a word uh, because there were dogs which the villagers had either in their farms or at their houses or when they were traveling. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a British uh, usage that we have adopted. Okay. Uh, and I think their common dog, uh, has changed across the country with the mix of, mixed with other breeds and so on, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the basic features uh, have been, you know, medium-sized dog with a curled tail and direct ears. and uh, But they have been mixed with dogs of different regions. And uh, I don't know if, if, if it's a breed. Uh, I don't think there would ever be a breed called the Indian Pariah because, again, for breed, you need a particular... Uh, strength in numbers in terms of the same features, which I don't mm -hmm. think we have because even even within the group uh, on the roadside, you'll find uh, differences in their structure and their heads and their ears right. and their eyes. Right. So it, it's a generic term which is used for the local Indian, native Indian dog, the original native Indian dog, which over okay. the years has been, you know, mixed with other breeds and... All right. And some bad-mannered, uh, well-bred uh, dogs <laughs> let loose by owners have contributed. All right. <laughs> okay. Th there is a question that I've been wanting to discuss right from the beginning of this conversation. I think we've covered most of our Indian breeds uh, fairly in detail, at least uh, as a good introduction. I, even I feel, for example, you know, very well introduced to the different breeds that we have in this country. 
and uh, in fact we have even uh, managed to uh, i only today recognize that we can even have groups within the indian you know origin breeds that are still developing and we can you know possibly work around things there is a question from one of our viewers rahul dev gupta who's asked this question about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the lucy slot being implemented in india uh, lucy's law essentially I says i can't read the question can you read it for me i will read it for you uh, uh, so what it says is that uh, uh, mr sharad going beyond your defense of breeders i have a theory. how the one stamp out the breeders cruel practices one hears so many horror stories isn't a law needed on the line of the lucy's law in england mr sharad being an ex civil servant as well as a dog fancier may please comment thanks rdg Oh yes, of course. There's a law needed, and uh, there is a law that uh, there's a law needed for every cruel practice. Why only the cruel practice of breeding? Right. There is a law needed. There is a law in place. If you read the right. latest laws, which call for registration of your pets with the municipal corporations and the living spaces and the breeding stands that have to be put in place. Mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. My so, defense of breeders is not for uh, indiscriminate uh, breeders. Absolutely, for breeders, I mean, I for breeders who are responsible. Yeah, no, I think I'm that's not something. Saying breed that... indiscriminately. Mm. And, right. I mean, and why only dogs? You should have you should have responsible breeders in cattle and in goats and in poultry and in horses and in everything. Why only dogs? Right. So I totally um, agree with Mr. Gupta. There should be a law. So uh, now, considering this uh, situation, has there been any uh, anything which is being planned and proposed uh, to be implemented by the Kennel Club of India? Because all almost all of the pure breed uh, breeders are registered with the KCI. Is there a regulation coming up in terms of regulating, or for that matter, what would I say? Mm, some amount of policing. The Kennel Club of India. No, no. There's enough policing in place by the Kennel Club of India already. Okay. For example, the the minimum age at which a bitch can be bred, right, has already been specified. Absolutely, yeah. And they have taken the size of the breed into consideration before specifying the age. So, for the age. very large or the giant breeds, right. age has been specified. Now, you can't just you can't just get a great den and breed her at the age of one year because she is not physically ready for it. Absolutely right, or a German Shepherd for that matter. Right. Similarly, the age of a stud dog has already been specified by the Kennel Club of India. Right. So you can't get a nine-month or a ten-month-old male dog and put him into stud service. Right. He, he might be able to perform, but it's not ethical, and therefore. Kennel Club of India doesn't recognize any such breeding. Absolutely. I think, and I have also observed that over a period of time, that uh, age limit has been increased by the Kennel Club for most of the breeds, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, we are alive to this uh, problem. Right. And there is, you know, uh, there are certification programs run by the Kennel Club of India on responsible breeding. Okay. Every litter before it's registered with the Kennel Club of India is inspected by uh, you know, people are appointed by the kennel club. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they go and check if you are applying for registration of six puppies that you actually have six puppies. Right. And you're not fudging papers and, you know, passing on papers to dogs that don't belong to the same pedigree. So right. kennel club is already alive to this. Right. But morality cannot be taught by kennel club. <laughs> morality has to come from within. <laughs> right. So I think we have taken a I very mean, uh, sorry, yeah, a good one hour. I mean, ten like, I, 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 yeah, and I think we've been able to fairly cover through most of the breeds and a good understanding. I think this can be a very good introductory session for anyone who wants to get introduced to, uh, you know, Indian breeds and uh, you know what uh, this dogs around Indian breeds and different kind of dogs that are there. Uh, there are some questions. I think we'll take one or two questions. I don't want to go back to the question there, but I remember someone asking, what is the best ideal dog for 
uh, um, uh, for Mumbai from an Indian breed perspective. I think in general, apart from one or two dogs, these are mostly very active working dogs, the, the Indian dogs are, right? They are either hounds or guard dogs and I don't see, uh, you know, it all depends on how much of time you give to your pet. Right. And how much of space you have. I said this yesterday and I'm repeating. Space right. and time are the only two considerations. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I would say that, uh, and I have some uh, close experience because we have a very dear friend of ours who's got a caravan hound. And, uh, you know, they uh, religiously walk the dog thrice a day. And that's a lot of walking that they do with him. And he's kept absolutely fit. And he's, I would say, the perfect dog that I've seen in terms of the coat quality that they maintain. He's like a black velvet, you know, as against the dogs which are yeah. uh, sometimes seen, you know. So uh, I, I think to in response to that question for what is an appropriate dog for Mumbai or for that matter any other place, my typical argument is if you are comfortable sitting someplace, any of these breeds of dogs are going to be comfortable sitting there with you. But if you keep them someplace else, Absolutely. where the weather condition may be different or they don't have the same kind of cooling that you may have, that is when everything you know becomes complicated and challenging. Yes, fortunately, the Indian hounds, the sight hounds from the Deccan are accustomed and acclimatized to the heat. Severe heat, yes. And yeah, that's yeah. true. So it's so, not too much of a problem. Mumbai heat is not a problem. Absolutely not. I think uh, uh, from a Mumbai perspective, it's only how much of exercise you can give them and how much of workout can they have, uh, t you know, time and space to go out for a, a reasonably good Absolutely. workout. I, I think that's all that matters. So uh, thank you so much, Shahid, for joining us on this. I think it was amazing to have this conversation. I really didn't think my I pleasure, my pleasure. So much in depth with the uh, you know Indian breeds. Um, thank you everyone for watching us and joining us and staying on with us for the last one hour. Um, I hope to see you all soon on uh, a similar session like this. And I think there's so much more on the Indian breeds that we can do probably pick on one or two breeds and work together. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And thank you so much, Sharad, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank bye, you, guys. Jay, and thank you, everybody. See you. Bye, bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.